Welcome back to the Sleep for Performance podcast. Today I'm joined by Liv Knowles. Now, Liv, before we get started, some people who might be watching this on YouTube are like, what happened to Ian's eye? <laughs> what did happen to your eye? Ian got punched in the face yesterday. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. But it was voluntary, sparring with some friends. So oh. let's not get all upset, everybody, and think that Ian is a thug that was out on the weekend fighting drunk. That never <laughs> happened. Very yeah. good. That's good to know. So just in case anybody wants to know, that's what happened. It's just some sp- friendly sparring with some friends in the garage that was that's what you do when you're a middle-aged man you have nothing else to do is it right okay i'll start making notes <laughs> yes i am i am losing my manhood so i'm trying to regain it by uh sparring a guy that's uh 16 years younger than me and 20 kilos heavier than me so i try to keep you uh, fit it'll keep you fit i'll keep me fit yeah <laughs> Maybe a bit bruised as well, but <laughs> <laughs> my my ego is not existent. <laughs> anyway, we're not here to talk about my black eye. Um, just in case everybody's looking at it and and because I know stories will fly around. I know the internet is, you know, very interested in what happens in my life. Not really. Anyway. <laughs> It'll be buzzing. <laughs> Livia, you join us from where today? Where, whereabouts are you located in the world? I'm in Melbourne at Deakin University, like located in the Burwood campus. In the Burwood, how many campuses is there for Deakin? Uh two, just Melbourne and um Burwood. Sorry, Burwood and Geelong. And Burwood's obviously a suburb or region of Melbourne. Yeah, spot yeah. on. Excellent. And where are you from originally, Liv? Um, I grew up in Melbourne. Um, so, yeah, spent my time growing up around the suburbs around um, Deakin anyway. So it was an easy fit for me to come here and, and do some study. Oh, yeah, very nice. And um, when you were growing up, were you into any sort of uh, crazy sport or were you just constantly into the science or what, um, what kind of what kind I of grew up, at? yeah, I grew up as a competitive swimmer. Um, oh. so swam at national level and did a bit of running, um, at that level as well. So yeah, I come from a looking at the back black line for, for hours on end. <laughs> yeah. I, I am myself actually, and one of your colleagues, Spencer, have just submitted a paper looking at ultra swimming and the relationship with sleep and oh, sleep cool. problems and obesity. And we actually just put in the, we had a, re, a round of reviews back and then we've just sub- resubmitted, I think on Thursday or Friday. So hopefully that will be published. I was looking at people okay. who swam to Rotnest. Oh, yeah, great. Uh, Rotnest yeah. Island, 20K Channel ultra swimming. swimmers. Yeah. So yeah, I know Spencer has done that swim and I've done it twice as well. I've done one duo and one solo. Um, so yeah. I can't say I like the ocean and open water swimming as much as I like it in the pool, but <laughs> well, I get, each I, their own. I tell you one thing, over the last couple of years, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like, mm, maybe not. There's been more yeah. and more shark um, <laughs> issues in the water. And, uh, yeah, don't read pasty, the reports in Sydney at the moment. <laughs> yeah, as a, as a white pasty Irish man in the water, I'm like, oh, I think I'll sail for a while, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> and so um, what, what, was your, what was your events when you were swimming? What were you? Uh, 100 and 200 metres backstroke. Oh, that's that's like the stroke that I cannot do. Well, <laughs> let, let, let me be honest with you. When we do medley in the pool, I just keep swimming freestyle. And then the coach got like, if you can't do butterfly, just do something else. And I'm like, yeah, I am. Okay, I would well, do just, that for breaststroke. I do just, backstroke while well, I'm meant to be doing breaststroke because I go backwards doing breaststroke. <laughs> well, I can't do anything. I can just only do front crawl. So I only start swimming, I think, at the age of 41. So oh, I, I was a... Uh, and I'm 44 now, so it's not that long. So, so I can't do anything. My medley is like swim hard or swim not so hard. And that's it. It's just two speeds. <laughs> Whatever gets you there, right? <laughs> and when you compete at national level, Liv, was that it, like going to the AIS at that level? Uh, no, not quite. Level? Unfortunately not. Um, I finished up swimming when I was about 19. So um, swam at Olympic trials and things like that, but never, oh, really? quite, um, never quite made the cut. Um, but that's all right. There's, always, there's only about what? one or two percent that make it isn't there um if that so yeah I really I learned a lot from from that I learned a lot about discipline organization you know determinedness and things like that so um I still swim occasionally now I'm probably doing a bit more running than swimming now can't usually spend more than about 30 45 minutes in a pool these days I get too bored now but um but yeah 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 running and swimming are quite opposite so I, I i came there but i went from a running background to a uh, swimming to swimming the last couple of years but quite different how do you find the transition to running um i really enjoy it for me it's um i work i work in football so as a t- that's a team ball sport so that's much far more unfamiliar to me um from an athletic standpoint in terms of me being able to do it i can't catch a ball or throw a ball very well um but you know straight line um worrying about myself um yeah, I enjoy that individual um, challenge. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. And what sort of distance are you doing in, in running? Are you competing or just doing it for fun? Um, I did a marathon a couple of months ago, um, nice. which was great. My first one. So, yeah, I'm Very enjoying good. that. 
how did you go time wise did you uh i i did that i went quicker than the time i wanted to go so i went about three da- three hours 20 so i was really happy with that yeah very very good for your first one that's really good yeah that's yeah, really really good, good yeah 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 Maybe when uh, maybe when things get back to normal, we might see uh, we might run into each other on the Melbourne Marathon. I've done that a few times myself. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, so yeah, that'll be uh, yeah. I'm I'm hoping when things open back up, I do a bit more for myself of uh, a bit more marathons and some other things. Yeah, absolutely. Very nice. Excellent. All right. So, Liv, tell us a little bit about your background before you went to university. What did you? What sort of subjects were you into at school? Were you were you always like a kind of a science geek, as we call ourselves, or were, did you have any interest in that? Or were you more interested in just doing the athletic part of and performing? Uh, yeah, I was a bit of a science geek. I probably did all of the sciences at school: um, psych, chemistry, biology, all of those. Um, and then I think because of that, and just my love of sport um, and I really loved the process of sport as an athlete too um, and why and understanding how and why coaches prescribe different gym or swimming sets for us. Um, I think so that then the combination of those two is what led me to doing a sports science undergrad. Yeah. Okay. And did you do sports science at Deakin or somewhere else? Yeah, I did. Deakin. At Deakin, I've, yeah. I've been at Deakin for all of my studies so far. Can't can't get rid of me. You want to be, you want to be careful. You might get Stockholm syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I yeah. Once that pandemic lifts, you need to get out of here. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and so you did sports science undergrad. Did you do an honours degree then as well? Yeah, I did. I did my honours degree in um, looking at how sports school students, um, their time commitments impact their well-being. Um, so yeah, we compared a student cohort at a sports school versus a normal school and just looked at how, um, those extra sports commitment commitments and things like that impacted, you know, their sleep, their, their wellness, things like that. Oh yeah. That's the one you had published. You had that published in, I think I saw that when I was looking up this one. Yeah. This yeah. I have. Yeah. 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 What was it? What, what do you find in that one level of interest? Cause that, that's, we don't do a lot of on this podcast. We don't talk a lot about young kids or teenage kids or, school going kids but just out of interest what can you give us a bit brief overview of that experiment and what you found yeah I think what we might have we sort of went into it expecting that those kids might be a bit more stressed and um and things like that because of that extra time commitment of their sport that they've got to fit in around their studies and things you know training early and late um the organization and that requires around their homework and things but what we actually found was that their well-being was almost better than the um sort of I guess in quotation marks normal sports Mm -hmm. um normal school students um and we put that down to things like um the teamwork and collaboration and things that's being I was a part of a sporting organization teaches you um, so that they were almost just as well, if not better set up to um, lead and fulfill the rest of their lives um, because of those lessons that they were getting out of their sport. Yeah, that's interesting because obviously over the last couple of years with the pandemic, people have spoken about the lack of social connections and, you know, yeah. the impact that has on people's mental health and well-being, and even, you know, having that social structure to go to in team environments or even club environments yeah, um, to go and exercise kind of one holds people somewhat accountable I hear from some of the feedback I've had from other people. You know, kind of like, well, if everybody's going, I should go as well and train. Yeah. And then also when you're there as well, interacting with other people outside of an academic or a work environment can be very stimulating as well. And giving your brain a sort of a break from the day to day monotony of of whether it be study or work or whatever it might be is, is helpful in terms of, um, I suppose, just giving you a break and allowing you to uh, let those things settle in your brain for a better word and, and go back to them with a fresh, fresh set of eyes and a, and a fresh body. And I, yeah. and I find personally myself as well, uh, you know, when you're doing a lot of, say, cognitive type of work, sitting at a desk or in a classroom or in a lecture hall, whatever it might be, getting out of that and getting into your body is quite helpful as a reset or a reboot. I, I do anyway. So it's like a priority for me every day to exercise, even if it's just low intensity, if it's just for a walk. But it has to be a priority because if I don't do that, I just can't seem to concentrate. I need that kind of uh, the kind of lightning bolt up my ass to get me going, really. Yeah, I mean, it's not my area, but I think there's a lot of research around, you know, having breaks and how that is really helpful for your ability to concentrate and be productive. So, um, yeah, it's really that social outlet is really important. Yeah, yeah. Any negative effects of the, was there any sort of outliers in the group that had negative effects of the extra exercise or team sports under Um, academic outputs? Off the top of my head, um, there was um, not that many. I don't recall the burnout um, scales, the athlete burnout scales that we look at um, having too much of an impact. These were pretty young athletes. They, um, most of them were about 
16 years of age. So um, potentially hadn't gotten to that, gotten to that point yet of, of burning out either. So, and these were also students that were in a sports school. So they weren't mm. just students who were going yeah, to school yeah. and then doing sport outside. They were being really well supported um, by a, a school structure that implemented their sports training within their school hours. So um, yeah, they were set up really well. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. So you went on then from your honours and you entered the PhD program. And what's yep. the focus of your PhD, which you're nearly finished? Um, it's a few months away, but hopefully we'll be yes, uh, hopefully. Getting, that, getting that little, uh, getting that sent off soon, that little uh, bundle of papers that represents three <laughs> or four years of your life, which is like, how would, how do I know I meant that? You just click but, uh, submit these days as well. <laughs> click, yeah. <laughs> um, so what was your, I might have lost you there for a moment. Okay, Liv has completely frozen here on our video. Hello. Hello. Five, four, three, two, one. You might have heard a little bit of music there. We had a slight technical issue. <laughs> uh, so, Liv, can you give us a little bit of an overview of your uh, PhD program and what, would, what were the aims of that program, what were you trying to do? Um, so I guess my interest in, in training and sport and exercise was why I got um, started in my PhD and I had a really good relationship with my now supervisor, Brad Aisbert, um, and his area of interest was sleep. Um, and so we had a chat and talked about how we could combine those areas and what else we might need to do to fill some gaps um, and also then brought on um, a couple of more people in um, Eric Drinkwater to look at the training space and Severin Lamon um, to bring some expertise in um, the muscle space. Um, and so I guess then the aim of my PhD became to understand how inadequate sleep affects uh, resistance exercise and muscle strength um, and what those implications are then for skeletal muscle health as well. Excellent. And were you working with any particular team or group or was it going to be multiple different groups? What was your target audience? Um, so at the start, we didn't have a particular target audience. Um, we knew that inadequate sleep affected a number of key groups being shift workers, um, new parents, uh, older adults and athletes. Um, so given that we were looking at potentially doing some training studies, um, we potentially go down the athlete or trained, trained participant um, cohort. Um, but then we then started to branch out as well into the female space too. Excellent. Yeah. I think um, Sev uh, presented some information on this actually, maybe a, ooh, might have been 2018 or 19. I want a shift work conference, I think in Alice Springs, where she spoke, uh, uh, Ayers Rock, where she spoke about shift work disorders, lack of sleep, and skeletal muscle. So this is obviously yep. building upon that type of work. Yes, yeah, but on. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Um, okay. So one of the papers that caught my attention actually was what, why I wanted to bring you on is like this is, the, the paper we're going to kind of discuss initially is inadequate sleep and, and muscle strength implications for resistance training. This is something we get asked a lot in the sleep world, probably a lot of physiologists get asked it, diet nutritionists get asked, what, what is the best time of day to train? What is the best time of day to, you know, like strength train or aerobically train? Obviously that falls into that chronobiology world. People often ask questions about what's the best time of day to, to eat so you can lose fat or not absorb calories. There's all sorts of crazy questions around this. But then also as well, how does sleep impact muscular strength? And so there's been a number of studies that have, have looked at this in different shape ways or forms or different sports. And it's hard to quantify, I suppose, what is muscle strength uh, first and foremost? And then how does that translate to a specific sport as well? So I don't know about you, Liv, but I've seen some athletes that, you know, lifting weights, for example, wouldn't be to be average sort of weightlifting ability, but in terms of sports specific stuff to be absolutely off the charts elite competing internationally. So it doesn't always be uh, just because you can lift something over your head at a certain way. It doesn't mean you're going to be the best boxer, for example, or the best runner or the best swimmer. Not so at all. It needs to be transferable. Like, yeah. yeah. So can you give us a bit of an overview of this, um, this review paper and uh, how you went about it? Yeah, well, I guess we, um, we came about 
um, putting it together um, because we knew that there was those populations that were um, more susceptible to inadequate sleep, but they also um, were likely to need muscle strength. If we think about shift workers, they need muscle strength to, you know, lift heavy things. Um, maybe if they're a paramedic or a fiery, whatever they might, might be. Same with athletes. They need mm. muscle strength for their athletic pursuits. Um, even, you know, new mums are lifting their kids up around. So all of these population groups that are experiencing adequate sleep are also potentially um, or likely to be training and doing muscle strengthening activities as well. Um, and so we wanted to understand how that lack of sleep that they're potentially getting is impacting that, that muscle strength or their capacity to train as well. And that also potentially has implications for um, muscle health because if um, we know that inadequate sleep um, predisposes us to more metabolic diseases um, and things like that. So an exercise or resistance exercise in particular might be a great way to um, alleviate those the risks of metabolic disease and things like that in sleep-deprived or sleep-restricted populations. So that's kind of how we came to deciding that we wanted to put this review together. Um, and then once we'd done all the processes of actually performing the systematic review, we had um, a number of different sort of recommendations come out of it, I suppose, based on the different findings that we found from sleep restriction and sleep deprivation um, as two separate um, groups, I suppose. Before we jump into the, the results of that, yeah. it's probably just worth noting that whilst people might think that, oh, there must be loads of stuff on this, what's surprising here is you only found 17 studies, mm -hmm. one seven. Yeah. that met the criteria, which is quite low. It's very low. So what, why do you think there was so, why was there so little studies out there, do you think? What, what, what's happening? Why aren't we I doing think, more of this space, do you think? I think the methodology has probably been poor in the past. Um, when it, the studies probably haven't been very good at reporting um, the actual sleep duration that they tested participants for, things like that. So as an example, we excluded um, any most of all, well, all of the shift worker based studies in this area because they weren't reporting what their sleep protocols were or how many um, hours of sleep that the participants um, in the study were getting each night. So that meant that a lot of studies were excluded because of our strict criteria as well. Um, mm -hmm. But we wanted to be pretty clear in what our recommendations were around the hours of sleep that you should be getting or um, how that, that lack of um, sleep impacts training as well. So I guess that's why we had a strict criteria too. Now, in your results, when you categorize the different D17 papers, did you segregate them out or parse them out in terms of which ones were done with polysomnography to go at standard, which were done with actigraphy and which were done with questionnaires or diaries? And if so, what was the rough distribution of those between those groups? Um, I think from the top of my head, we had about three or four that did use um, polysomnography or actigraphy, but that was it of the 17. So the rest were just reporting that they had their participants sleep, you know, between between 3 and 6 a.m., for example, um, and that was it. And there were no other markers or parameters assessing sleep. Um, and wow. that is, again, one of the limitations of, of these findings. That is a big limitation, isn't it? Because it's yeah. obviously self-reported sleep can be hugely yeah. variable, particularly in athletic yeah. populations. And to the degree of what sleep they had and then the effect on their performance could be highly skewed by that. Yeah, particularly whether, depending on whether, and most studies don't report this, but we whether they had the participants sleeping in a laboratory or if they were just having them, asking them to sleep less at home and things like that, that does, does make a big difference. Yeah, yeah. And of course, people can just tell lies. Oh, yeah, I got eight hours sleep because yeah. I was at my girlfriend or boyfriend's house and we were <laughs> whatever, yep. or we were playing video games or whatever. They were Absolutely. Doing. <laughs> um, can we just clarify a few terms before we talk about the results a bit more? Because there's a couple of terms there you threw around, which I find even causes confusion amongst chronobiologists yeah. and sleep scientists and sports scientists, which is sleep deprivation sleep restriction, sleep loss. And yeah, there might be a few other ones in there as well, different variations. Because we start with what sleep deprivation is. How do you classify sleep deprivation in this, in this review? So in this review, we classified sleep deprivation as at least 24 hours of wake, um, wakefulness, I suppose. Um, so you're not getting any sleep in that nighttime period. So sometimes that actually might mean that the participant has up to you know 36 hours of wakefulness yeah. because they might not do the testing until the afternoon that next day but essentially they haven't gone to sleep at all during the nighttime period um in comparison you have sleep restriction where you have you get a sleep opportunity but it is short um and so that might be three hours that might be six hours but it is less than what um we might consider either adequate sleep or they would the you know 
researchers considered normal sleep or usual sleep for the participants. And then obviously in those restriction type studies, it's going to be, you can subcategorize those or divide them again between. So we've often spoke before in this podcast about predominantly in the first half of the night is non-REM sleep and the latter half of the night is and REM sleep. So you can obviously restrict them for REM or non-REM. Did, did, yeah. did, did, did that happen in any of these papers? Yeah, a couple. And I think one of them looked at um, a delayed sleep onset versus an early awakening onset protocol as well. Um, so yeah, it's certainly something that we looked at and is really interesting too. Uh, so you got sleep deprivation and sleep restriction. Was there any other terms in here that we need to... Uh, I guess we tried to stick with the, word, the term um, inadequate sleep to cover, you know, your sleep loss, your, and those yeah. sort of terms, just anything that sort of talks about not getting enough sleep. We use the single term of inadequate sleep throughout this paper to cover, to cover those very wide reaching terms. Yeah. That's kind of similar to terms I've been using living in sort of any papers I've done or reports I've written. I've said sleep deprivation is where basically people have been forced to stay awake and not allowed any sleep opportunity for, you know, at least 24 hours or even more. Um, yeah. And then a sleep restriction will be a deprivation of a, well, it can be a, a deprivation of a period of sleep or restricted sleep period, be non-REM or REM phase yeah. predominantly. And then sleep loss is basically where people have been observed in the wild <laughs> and haven't <laughs> achieved the uh, seven to nine hours of sleep. So every yeah. hour, every kind of, you know, if, the, if they're a shift worker, for example, and they get five hours and they're supposed to get between seven to nine, that would be technically two hours of sleep loss. And that sleep yeah. loss can be due to behavior or it could be to call outs or it could be to yeah. actually injury, whatever it might be. Well, yeah, kind of very similar language there. I think maybe in our fields, we, I would really love to see a kind of a standard definitions and terminology be used across particularly sports related chronobiology research, because we, we use a lot of things interchangeably and we, we assume that, you know, it's common, like total sleep time and sleep duration. Like we, yeah, it meant, well. it meant that our, we had a lot of search terms because we did have to put in yeah. sleep loss, insufficient sleep, inadequate sleep and things like that just to cover all our bases. Yeah. Which is a bit of a pain. Like if we, if you look at some of the work that Michael Estella has done about, yeah, and I think Grace Vincent as well about kind of putting a bibliography together or a, uh, of all the research that's been done, surprisingly, like there's been not much research done in athletics and sleep. It's really only since 2010, it's kicked off. Yeah. And, you know, I, I always say it's a sad set of affairs when you see my name in the top researchers in Australia, that's, that's when you know it's pretty shit. So we need to do way more because I'm not a full-time academic. So, you know, there needs to be a lot more work done in these fields. Um, but it's really only kind of commenced since 2010. So that's why we'll probably see a lot of these limitations and it's not, as a result of us as researchers, it's a result of, um, what do you think it's a result of, Liv? What do you think it's, why hasn't this happened before? Um, I think it's because we haven't put clear protocols in place and things like that about how we should go about, about the methods for these types of studies that, you know, researchers can follow. Um, mm -hmm. It's similar to, and I'm sure we'll get into this a bit later, but similar to the data in females that's coming out at the moment because that's a big space um, and how we should be measuring the menstrual cycle and making yeah. sure that researchers do that really consistently. So I think it's pretty similar in the sleep space um, in terms of terminology and how we actually go about measuring each different parameter. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, yeah, a bit of consistency. And I also think as well, like there's a, there's a kind of a misnomer out there that big you know, rich sports teams are pumping lots of money into research. That's not the case. I would probably, uh, you know, guess that you, like when I did mine, it's very much self-driven and you're reliant on athletes and teams to basically give you data and work with you and you're reliant yeah. on government funding for your scholarship, but there's no research grants out there. There's very little sports research funding you can apply for. And Absolutely. big, you know, rich teams don't spend a lot of money on doing this sort of thing. So, yeah. No, pretty, there's a lot more funding in, in health than there is in sport. Um, but there are still, you know, things that we can apply to both. Yeah, for sure. That's right. There's a lot of crossover. That's for sure. All right. Let's, um, let's go through some of the results you found from this then. Where, where would you like to start? Do you want to go through the, 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 the kind of common topics, what you've laid out in the results? Yeah, sure. Or? Do you want to start with sleep restriction maybe? Yep. Let's go with that. Yeah. Um, so I guess one of the main findings that we, um, found out of the sleep restriction studies were that um, after there was one study in particular that after three nights of three hours sleep, they found a decrease in strength in um, our larger muscle group exercises. So your squats and your deadlifts. Um, and they found that on each of those three nights, 
but they only found a decrease in strength in our bench press, which is still um, a bigger exercise than maybe a machine based exercise, but it's only upper body. It's not quite as full body as a, as a squat and a deadlift and that only decreased in strength on the third night. Um, so we really saw that those big muscle group, larger exercises, um, they were really quite impacted by sleep restriction over multiple nights. So it was mainly the bench press that was affected, was it? Um, so bench press wasn't as affected. So it was affected on the third night only, yeah. but um, squats and deadlifts were affected every night. Right. Okay. And what, what, what do you reckon that might be from? Well, we think it's probably the size of the muscle group as well. Um, and, you know, the recruitment of muscle fibers and things that you, you need for those larger um, movements and also the cognitive load that's required for those movements as well. Um, and the effect that sleep has on, has on your cognitive and cap capacity to lift those bigger movements. And um, was that three hour um, sleep each night? Do you know if that was in the first half of the night or the back end of the night? When, when I don't think this study reported, um, reported that protocol. No. Right. So really, it, you've got two choices here as a strength athlete. You can skip leg day, never do legs and just do upper yep. body like some of the guys do at the beach. Or if you don't skip leg day, you may need to make sure you get an adequate sleep afterwards because these are going to be sever severely affected. Yeah, that or I guess what I was about to go into next is um, the other things that we found with sleep restriction was that there were motivational strategies that did help. So um, there was one study that found that um, the training load decreased with sleep restriction, but was restored with caffeine ingestion. Um, mm. So if you can increase that alertness or perhaps, um, you know, reduce that perceived exertion, then you might be able to still execute that lifting session. Well, caffeine does help with skeletal strength, doesn't it? Or, or yeah. my, my, is, it, is, it is that correct? In, I think in so. And, but, well, certainly alertness and um, your capacity to lift, absolutely. Yeah, I thought there was three mechanisms how caffeine... Um, Supplements are certainly not my, <laughs> my area, so I won't profess well, to know too much. Uh, th this is absolutely diabolical because I have published a paper in caffeine, but it was so many years <laughs> ago that I can't remember. And I haven't done much caffeine research since then. But... Um, this is something now I'm definitely going to have to just pull up here and have a quick look at to correct myself to make sure that I'm not telling lies, number one. No, that's and, number, and number two, <laughs> I will drive myself mad until I find the answer about this, um, about how caffeine affects. This was in a paper a few years ago on Super Rugby. And oh, cool. I think in the introduction, I actually spoke about caffeine and how it affects this will drive me mad now until I find this. There was three mechanisms. I have to have to get them. This is terrible, <laughs> isn't it? Please hold while I search for this. <laughs> we'll put some hold music on. This is terrible. So we spoke about the adverse effect on caffeine and sleep in the introduction. I have to look it up myself at some point too. Maybe I took it out after the review. Bloody reviewers. <laughs> I'm going to have to find this, but it's basically there's three different ways that caffeine can help. One is obviously with that cognitive alertness, but there's something about recruitment of... Mm, can't find it. I'm, and I'm under pressure now, so I'm going to end up not finding it or saying something different. So I'm going to have to find yeah. it out. Maybe I'll put it into the show notes, but I'm going to find out afterwards. It's driving me yeah. crazy. Or maybe I have to pause the podcast and we'll start for two <laughs> hours. <laughs> so anyway, we're here to talk about your work, not mine. So let's, let's, uh, let's keep moving on that. Um, so the caffeine actually helped these guys by uh, alertness in terms of um, yeah. getting them sort of G'd up and ready to go. And um, yeah. how was the caffeine administered? Was it just coffee or tablets or gum? I think or? it was ca um, tablets from, from memory, um, okay. but we didn't look look too much into the protocol i guess we we're more just looking at the actual um supplementation that really helped them um so we looked at that we looked at um there was a study with napping as well um yeah. they actually didn't find an effect of of napping um but that was on a grip strength test so i we hypothesized that given that we found that sleep restriction reduced compound strength exercises that it, there might still be an effect of napping on those larger exercises that do require more alertness and cognitive load um, given the, the results of caffeine too. So um, yeah, those were some interesting findings. Mm. 
did they look at maybe was there any sort of blinding of participants to caffeine like randomized you know, caffeine non-caffeine because i i often wonder about the caffeine strategy about placebo that have just as much as effect on on it as you know actually having the the caffeine itself, they didn't do any of that in the studies, did it? Wasn't that advanced, was it? I'm not sure that they did. We Obviously, you can't blind participants to sleep restriction, but I don't yeah. think they then mentioned <laughs> whether you... <laughs> I meant, to the, ca- I meant um, to the caffeine, so yeah. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Um, and then, so I don't know that they mentioned whether they were blinded to the caffeine. I Yeah, I can't remember. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway, um, so that was on the sleep restriction. Um, that was the yeah, and then the I guess the last... Yeah, those ones were um, were less than six hours and less than four hours for a single night. And then we also found that one study showed that um, strength in the evening was decreased after one night of three hours sleep as opposed to strength in the morning. Um, so that longer wake time, again, um, impacting strength. Now, this contradicts the whole chronobiology field because yes. it generally shows that in the evening time, muscular strength is at its best roughly between kind of 5 and 7 p.m. in the evening before the wake maintenance and so on. But yep. when you have a big period of sleep deprivation uh, restriction, sorry, the night before, the longer the wakefulness then it actually has a deleterious effect on that strength outcome. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, spot on. So if you, we talk about that in the review, how for people who are fully rested, absolutely training at that sort of 5 p.m. time in the evening is probably best for your out strength outcomes. But if you're, as you said, sleep restricted, then it might be worth reshuffling your training timing um, to be in the morning if you're, if you're motivated enough to. So a lot of people then live will say, oh, but, you know, it's better if I get up early in the morning and I, and I lift weights. Would, would that be the case then from this or would this not be the case? Um, if, if they're not getting enough sleep, yeah. Um, if, if they are getting what we call adequate sleep or if they feel like they can function well from the sleep that they're getting, um, then perhaps evening it remains to be fine. But, yeah, what we found was that with inadequate sleep, so they had these participants have three hours sleep um, that perhaps – morning mm. training was was better so maybe a message will be if you had a bad night's sleep and you woke up to go train and maybe maybe skip that for that morning use that yeah. extra time to sleep in and maybe do a workout later on in the evening if you can or even just have a rest there probably better absolutely. off absolutely yeah i mean i guess uh, always we want to say sleep more um i guess this is largely for the people who can't sleep more for mm-hmm. whatever reason it might be as well yeah yeah, but I think if you're habitually sleeping three hours a night, you've got some bigger problems than just your strength training, yeah. really. You know, I'd so. go speak to you, <laughs> GP. Yeah. Go and see somebody, yeah. Um, the other one here as well is, <clears throat> um, on, on this topic as well as, and this is probably a word of caution for people who exercise early in the morning, is if you have any uh, hypertension or you've got blood pressure issues, high blood pressure issues, exercising early in the morning is actually quite dangerous. Mm. So a lot of research around that as well. So if you have had a bad night's sleep and you maybe have high blood pressure, a tendency, and then getting up exercising in the morning, it's not going to do you too much good. You might blow a gasket, so to speak. So you might just want to, um, pardon the pun, exercise a bit of caution around that and maybe rest <laughs> a bit and, and do something different. Yeah. So what about the sleep deprivation, which is a bit more, um, this is where it gets a bit harder. Um, you're going to see this probably, this is people being awake for over 24 hours. So long distance ultra running events, this happens military this happens as well and um, even in some firefighters in like america to do 24-hour shifts so they're kind of you know getting blasted by a big emergency do you want to have this happen as well or um you know these are the type of people that would would, would be engaging in this um so what did you find on this one on deprivation? yes we found some contradicting findings um around this one so with um people that had just been sleep deprived and they weren't doing sort of extra exhaustive exercise like you talked about military and things like that so if they were just doing a training session they were able to maintain Um, their lifting capacity so they were able to complete a full session Um, and what we found around those studies were more often than not they were having their participants training groups so we think that that again we talked about social Mm -hmm. um, facilitation earlier being able to have someone with you to you know pump you up get you through the through the sets and reps um, might help to maintain your lifting capacity but what we found with protocols that had um, other exercise elements attached to them so um, treadmill running or walking or other exercise components around them that's when we saw a decrease in strength when they had those extra things yeah yeah um, i guess and i guess it, that that extra exercise is just exaggerating that effect of the of the sleep restriction and the fatigue and how is, is there a commonality across how this muscular strength has been measured in all these papers or is it all varied 
it's all very varied. Um, so some papers would look at um, grip strength, some would look at um, talk through um, different ranges of, of knee flexion and extension, others would look at um, the capacity to execute a full training session. So, you know, multiple exercises with multiple sets and reps, some would look at 1RM tests. Um, so it was all very different across studies. So technically, would some of them be muscular endurance, do you think? Sorry? Would, would some of those be technically muscular endurance? Um, possibly. Um, some of the military-based ones were probably more muscular endurance, yeah. Um, like but we did try and, and keep it as... And, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Have you come across any of Gary Kamamori's research from the US military? The name rings a bell. He's done some stuff around sleep deprivation, sleep yeah. loss, and caffeine. It's quite interesting, like how basically um they do a lot of those type of tests like kind of um what would you get like kind of job specific testing in an infantry yeah. soldier so like run 5ks or three miles or whatever it might be you know uh fiddle sandbags and bag them yeah, and make a with wall, a pack on your back with yeah. a pack on your back these rock marches all these different types of things and it's very interesting to see it that basically when it had sleep deprivation over time the crux of the study was i think in this one was um caffeine will help it'll help them stay alert and it'll help them kind of keep moving but their accuracy is completely gone so in terms yeah. of like when they're firing shots at a, at a target accuracy is all over the place but they're still able to keep going so yeah it's quite, that's quite the, interesting yeah and that's the danger with doing um those more if you olympic lifts and things like that that require um really precise technique and things like that as well if you're if you're sleep restricted or sleep deprived and um that cognitive awareness and alertness is, is down too. You don't want to be doing really complex movements. You might be mm. better off if you're not going to skip leg day, you might be better off just hopping on the leg press, which is a more controlled machine based exercise. Yeah. That's a lot safer as well. Yeah. Or the Smith machine or something like that, where yeah. you're not going to be yeah, free weights and have the tendency to fall over. Yeah. Spot or on. start swinging yeah. a kettlebell that goes out through the roof. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So safety is really important. Yeah. <laughs> My wife says to me, be careful that kettlebell. If that goes out through the wall, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when we lived in an apartment that was, uh, she was like, didn't like it whatsoever. So yeah, um, you don't want to get kicked out of your home, people, especially during the COVID pandemic, there's not much housing. No. Um, so we had, we had sleep deprivation. We had um, sleep restriction. And what about anything about sleep loss? Was there any of that? Or were they habitually looked at people over time? Was there any of that? There wasn't anything that was over time. I'm no. Um, so we were only able to find sort of more acute based studies. Um, and so that was certainly one of the gaps we highlighted um, that we needed more, more studies that looked at um, sleep restriction that replicates potentially the, a real world scenario, like, you know, maybe five to six hours over multiple nights, as opposed to just sort of a single night or one to two nights of three hours sleep, because yeah. that's probably not what more people, um, what, not what most people are getting. Yeah, I think this is an interesting one because this is in, a, in an era of lots of social media and, you know, I had to use the old Trump thing about fake news, but there is a lot of, um, well, let's just say shitty science out there. And we, we've all seen this where people just come out with these sleep tips or strength tips or just crazy stuff week in, week out. And you, you probably get asked like 50 million questions in this live and so do I, but it's, it's interesting on the muscular strength one and the trend and exercise because people, particularly I find older people, and I will say older being over 35 just in general this is completely anecdotal in my experience they feel like they have to get up in the morning at five do all this training for a couple of hours and then go to work and then come home in the evening you know and then catch up on emails after dinner after they spend time with their family and then go to bed around 10 uh probably fall asleep around 11 and they're back up between four and five through this training again so they're constantly kind of missing out on enough sleep each night just chipping away at just a small amount every night and it's in terms of the allowable time for recovery because it's not like even they're going, well, at seven or eight, I'm going to switch off. They're kind of maybe on email or on the phone or things like that. They're not giving themselves this adequate time. And then you just see them over time going, well, I've had some people like that come to me and go, oh, I'm just always tired. It's like, well, you want to get eight hours sleep and you're allowing seven hours sleep. Like, it's just mathematics. It's not going to work for you. Yeah, particularly when we try and then catch up on that sleep on a weekend. Um, but we know that having a consistent sleep time is actually really important yeah. for good quality sleep. So, um, yeah, the more consistent you can get that sleep time, the better. And most people really don't catch up. They, they start actually doing more on the weekend because, oh, i got to yeah. catch up with my friends and we were invited to this party and then I tried to get in actually a bigger bike ride on the weekend or I tried yeah. to go and lift weights early. You know, it's just crazy. And then people wonder why they're so tired. So <laughs> you're probably sometimes better off doing a shorter, sharper session later on in the day as opposed to, to early in the morning. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. yeah. It's a fascinating area, this whole area around muscular strength because it's such a commonly asked question, but 
like you said, there's not much out there and there is some contradictory results on it as well. So, yeah. What, yeah. what else, uh, Liv, did you find here on this one? Anything else of, that we didn't cover in these three groups? Um, I don't think so. I think probably the only other one was that we only, only one of the studies of all of those 17, look, of those 17 studies had a female only group. Um, so a lot of this data is primarily based in, in males. Um, mm. And we also know that um, females are more likely to report um, insomnia or poor sleep. So we actually see much poorer sleep in females, yet we don't have a lot of data um, in female participant groups in this area either. And strength and participation in sport by females is, is growing. Um, we see that in, in sport. So it's an area that we th um, think is also really important to cover in, in the future too. Excellent. Before we move on and talk a little bit about female athletes, I just want to confirm that uh, I found this here was the earliest pre proposed mechanism of this is in a in an article about pharmacology of caffeine so i just took this excerpt out here because this was driving me crazy the earliest proposed <laughs> mechanism of action for caffeine involved in mo mobilization of intracellular calcium calcium certain actions of caffeine in skeletal muscle appear to involve ionic calcium so i think that's what i was trying to get at in terms of skeletal muscle so their studies have shown obviously that alertness like you said the cognitive one but then there's another one yeah. about there's been some studies around skeletal muscle in terms of when you Signaling consume pathways. caffeine. So yeah. which is probably what, what happened in that study there where they had that extra extra boost in energy and were able to lift a little bit more. So potentially. You know, yeah. And that's another thing that we found from from these studies is was that there wasn't really any mechanistic explanations. A couple of studies looked at um, testosterone and cortisol and um, and the ratios between those two hormones to provide some sort of explanation. But again, some Studies found that they decreased, some studies found that it increased. So there wasn't mm. really anything there that was concrete to sort of point us in the direction of um, these certain markers could be influencing your adaptation to that strength training too. And I know there's probably some people listening to this going, the, the gears are probably clicking in their head going, wow, so if I get a bad night's sleep and then I go to the gym later in the day, but if I use caffeine, that'll help me actually have a really good workout. And the answer to that is yes, it will. But then you need to think of the downside, the other side of the mountain coming down, which is, you start consuming caffeine at five, six o'clock in the evening, it's going to be at least four or five hours of a half-life. So you're probably going to set back in a bad cycle again in terms of not being able to sleep that night. And, and you cause a lot of disruption, particularly if you're taking those pre-workout drinks, which are laced with caffeine and all sorts, sorts of other stimulants. So, you know, you just need to be careful of that as well because uh, there's no biological free ride. What goes Absolutely. up must come down. And, and that's where you might implement one of those other strategies. So, you know, training with, with mates where they, you can push each other instead yeah. or, you know, having a nap um, or things like that or training in the morning, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, pick the, pick the strategy that works best for you. Yeah. So, Liv, you spoke there a little bit about female athletes and how there was very little on it. Now, you've been exploring this in your, in your work as well um, with female athletes. What, what do we need to know about female athletes in terms of muscular strength and sleep? So... There's a lot of um, research at the moment that's starting to emerge, um, particularly around female athletes and the menstrual cycle and how that impacts training and things like that as well. Um, and I think there's a bit of a problem as well, like we talked about before in terms of the methodology between those papers, but ultimately at the moment, there's probably not enough data to tell us how we can give um, sleep strategies um, specifically to females, but also um, female athletes as well. So. Uh, yeah, I guess we just need we need more research in those areas because we are seeing studies that are showing that strength might be do, decreased um, in the late follicular phase just before females ovulate. So if there are phases in the cycle um, where our strength is greater or, or weaker, um, and we also know that sleep tends to be poorer um, just before um, menstruation as well. So if we know these things are happening across the cycle, how can we best prepare our female athletes um, to approach those different phases as well? So live. I'm an, I'm an uneducated man who just doesn't ask any questions. So tell me what are the phases in the menstrual cycle and what, what's the kind of the, the rough guide to what's happening with sleep in those? Yeah, mind. absolutely. So we have two phases in the menstrual cycle, the follicular phase and the luteal phase. So if a normal cycle is about 28 days, a normal cycle actually can last from anywhere between 21 and 35. But if we use a 21, 28 day cycle, the follicular phase would last for about 14 days and the luteal phase would last for about 14 days. What we tend to see um, across, sorry, just to provide some more context with um, in the follicular phase, that's when we see um, 
menstruation, so we see a bleed. Um, at the start of the luteal phase, we have ovulation. So that's when an egg is released, just to give you some context around those cases yeah. as well. Um, so in terms of sleep, we see um, that sleep is reported as being more poor um, during the late luteal phase. So just as people are starting um, about to come into menstruating again and during menstruation itself as well. Um, that's what we're mostly seeing in terms of sleep. There's not a lot of... Um, high quality data in terms of post-omnography and things like that in sleep architecture yeah, yeah. with phases yet but hopefully hopefully we see that in the future too now when you say poor sleep is it just reduction in total sleep time or is it longer time to fall asleep is it more fragmentation and awakenings is it waking up earlier um it's mostly reported sleep quality so symptoms yeah. of poor sleep um you know <clears throat> pain you know sleep disturbances things like that so pain temperature un yeah. uncomfortable yeah Absolutely. Okay. So how, how, how do you think people could actually, um, researchers or practitioners, capture this if they were doing research? Um, I think it's just about if you are doing research, whatever it might be on, is implementing atigraphy messages or, or something similar um, across each phase of the cycle um, at certain time points. So asking your participants um, how their sleep is or, yeah, monitoring those different sleep phases and, like you said, sleep duration, how much they're getting to see if that does change objectively as well. Is there any tools out there that we can use like uh, diaries or um, apps? Like uh, what was one I heard recently about P-Tracker and things like this that people could use as researchers to be able to extract that information to marry up with the sleep data? Is that possible? Yeah, so there are a few apps out there at the moment. There's a couple, um, Fitter Woman, Flow, Clue. Um, those are three different apps that I'm aware of that um, when you – um, if you go into the app each day, you can log your various symptoms, your sleep duration and things like that. So people listening can, can just download those apps at home and do that for themselves personally right now as well um, and log how their sleep or other symptoms change across each day of the menstrual cycle and might change when they have a bleed and things like that as well. Yeah, yeah. And so what sort of work are you doing around this at the moment, Liv? So um, we've just finished off a study that's um, looked at sustained sleep restriction. So by that, I mean um, sort of more than that, that one night that we talked about. So we've actually sleep restricted female participants for nine nights and they got five hours sleep a night um, in our labs. And then we've had them do gym sessions during the day. We've taken muscle biopsies from them and things like that to, <laughs> to test a whole lot of things. Um, yeah. Can you just tell people what is involved in a muscle biopsy? So a muscle biopsy involves getting a local anesthetic. Um, we take a piece of muscles from the thigh. So the local anesthetic goes into the thigh. Um, and then we use a reasonably sized needle to um, almost suction a piece of muscle out. It's about the size of a grain of rice. Um, but as I like to tell my participants, muscle grows back. Um, and that local Ooh. anesthetic. <laughs> I dropped my means... pain in anger. Ooh, <laughs> the local anesthetic means they feel more of a pressure or pulling sensation as we take the muscle out as opposed to pain so it's not and too bad how often do you do those muscle biopsies um each participant had eight in total over the <gasps> sleep and the normal sleep trial the sleep restriction and normal sleep trial so they had quite a few did anybody just go look i can't do this anymore stuff they were all pretty good um you get you get tears you get some weird responses to um to muscle biopsies some people just laugh through the whole thing it's bizarre really um yeah yeah <laughs> It's very amusing. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't find it amused if I was a participant if you were driving something to my thigh. <laughs> so nine nine nights of um, of sleep in the lab. Did you use actigraphy or PSG or um, actigraphy? Actigraphy, yeah. and so you controlled the sleeping environment and then you did some yeah. testing as well. Now I know this paper's in review, but are you able to? Have you presented any stuff at conferences? Are you able to allude to what you found, or is it top? Yeah. Secret? Um, we pre um, presented some of the results at the Sleep Down Under conference um, late last year. Yep. Um, so we found some differences in terms of um, training quality versus training quantity. So our main finding was that the females, they, they didn't just do a muscular strength test, like a 1RM test or anything. They did yep. a full training session so that we could try and simulate what people are doing out in the real world. So um, from that training session, they were able to execute all of the sets and reps that were prescribed for them. So the training quantity was maintained with the sleep restriction. But what we found was we put a um, gym aware unit on the bar of each of the lifts as well. So a gym aware unit measures the speed of the bar 
And so from that velocity data, we can get um, a sense of the quality of the movement as well, that that quality was decreased, um, particularly with our lower body lifts, our squats and our deadlifts, um, but it didn't decrease with our bench press, similar to that other study that we mm. talked about earlier. Um, so those bigger muscle group type exercises um, might be more severely impacted by the sleep restriction compared to our smaller muscle groups or yeah, smaller, more isolated exercises. And um, was that a gradual decline from a baseline or was it just a continual gradual decline day upon day? Um, it was pretty um, standard from the baseline. So it didn't yeah. really decline more as time went. Um, it just declined in the sleep res um, restriction condition overall. So for example, if it went down by 10%, it was sustained at 10% for the next yeah. nine days. Yeah. Yes, and was well. it just a velocity or the total weight that was lifted as well? So we maintained the total weight um, at a percentage of the participants, 1RM. So that didn't actually change because we'd prescribed that. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, so it was just the velocity that we were looking at. Okay. And was that the main signal you found through the velocity or was there anything else you found? Um, so we did some neuromuscular type jump tests. So they did like a drop jump test prior to each training session and we didn't find any differences there. Um, so in terms of being ready to train, that readiness to train, we didn't find any differences, um, but we did find that RPE went up. So yeah. um, while they were able to maintain what they um, were able to lift into, in the session, they found it harder. Um, and I guess there are, there are different implications of that that we've talked about already, safety and things like that as well. Um, yeah. Do you, this could be complete speculation, so speculate away, no one's going to hold your feet to the fire on this one, but mm -hmm. how much do you think maybe individual differences in terms of, let's say, a mental strength or resilience or someone's devotion to a sport or where they are in their career or just the type of person they are with any sort of grit um, compared to other people, how much do you think that has played into some people basically performing well under sleep restriction? Yeah, it's interesting because we had all trained participants. So um, these were all females that regularly went to the gym and they were also pretty pretty gnarly girls, you know, signing up for mm. a, a study of nine nights of getting five hours sleep with muscle biopsies and things like that. So I think we probably attracted a certain yeah. type of participant that was um, did have pretty good determination and things like that to challenge themselves. Um, so that certainly might be a factor to consider. Um yeah, I obviously can't speak to what would happen if we were to recruit people that weren't as mentally tough as as such, I suppose, but it could certainly be a factor. Yeah, that, yeah, it's pretty interesting. What Were all these uh, female athletes from the one sport? No. Or different? No. So what sports were, were represented? Um, so they weren't chosen from sports specifically. They just had to have been resistance trained. So complete, okay. um, have been training for at least six months for the last two years um sorry for at least six months and at least twice a twice a week um but most of the girls have been training for at least three or four years and were very competent lifters mm. so from from your work then live looking at um this area of sleep muscular strength and female athletes where where do you think the field needs to go to next what's what if you were sitting back and you had a big bucket of cash where would you direct your research i probably start looking at how we can then um change our prescription for training as well around this. We've basically just said training has, um, or the quality of training has decreased. Um, and we also have some, hopefully in the works, some adaptation and markers of adaptation that will come through soon. Um, but then being able to take the next step and say, okay, we know this happens, but then how do we actually prescribe training to female participants so they're actually getting the most out of training um, is probably the next step as well. Hmm. This is an area that's been highlighted over the last couple of years in an area that I'm interested in, which is combat sports. Yep. And um, if if anybody's not familiar with combat sports, a lot, particularly at the professional level, people will, will cut, it's called cutting weight or making weight. And so they might train for six weeks for a fight, whether it be, you know, jujitsu, karate, kickboxing, MMA, whatever it is. And then in the week of the fight, they will drop a lot of weight and um, ending up to about 20 pounds on average or you know, eight to 10 kilos. And this is generally done by um, water loading and so on. Now, if you want to follow somebody who does this really well, the fight dietitian, Jordan Sullivan, is one of the best in the business on this on Instagram. And then a core researcher of mine, uh, Reid Real up at um, UFC Shanghai, has done his PhD and his work at the IS as well. And we've published some papers on this together, but Reid is the expert in this area. I'm not, but I looked at some of the sleep around this as well. But this has been highlighted actually as one of the issues um, live over the last few years because ladies when they're trying to make way female fires in that week depending on where they are in their menstrual cycle 
it can just really play a havoc with them in terms of water retention and so on. So again, I know that the UFC have been looking at some of this stuff as well in terms of menstrual cycle. Um, and it's something I, I haven't done myself. And I've run studies that have been 50-50 in judo with male and female, never even looked at it. I've run studies in um, elite female basketball teams, never looked at it. I've run studies in middle-aged sort of athletes, amateur, 50-50, never really looked at it. So for me, it's definitely something I'm going to have to build into my methodology going forward because, you know, it is, it is a factor and we need to, we need to at least collect some data and look at it and start, you know, doing something on it. So for me, this has been a, this has been a eye-opener for me in terms of extra methodologies that I need to be considering when I'm doing work. Yeah, absolutely. Because I guess women aren't just small males. So, and we do have different physiology and things like that. So it's really important to look at, but at, at, on the flip side of that, um, we can't change competition dates and things like that around our menstrual cycle. So mm. there is an element of, um, while it's really important to find this stuff out, to find this stuff out, sorry. Um, there's also an element of suck it up. You're going to have to, world records are broken, gold medals yeah. are won, regardless of what stage of the menstrual cycle you're at. Um, so, but I guess the more informed we can be, the better. Yeah, and knowledge is power. If you know where yeah. you are, and at least you can manage it and, and exactly. do things appropriately. You know, manipulate by body weight or change around training sessions, whatever it might be, and yep. you can still kind of adapt and overcome. Absolutely. Excellent, Liv. Any final points you'd like to make in any of your work that you've been doing so far before you uh, get to wrap up your PhD thesis in a few months? I don't think so. Just no. get more sleep. Get more sleep. Us, yeah, let's get more <laughs> easy, sleep. <laughs> easy as that. Huh? Excellent. Liv, well, after you submit your PhD thesis, what's your plan? What's the uh, what's the next step for you? Uh, the big question. I'm not sure yet. Um, I work in, in sport as well at the moment. So um, I'll either stay in sort of that high performance sport industry in Australia or um, look at getting an academic job. So we'll see what we'll see what happens. But um, one of those two pathways. Who do you, who do you work for in sport? I work for the Western Bulldogs AFLW team. Liv, if people want to follow your work, want to get in contact, maybe want to give you a million dollars to research, uh, to fund your research, which has never happened on the podcast, but hey, it may happen. How can they get in contact with you? Um, mainly on Twitter. So um, at Liv Knowles one is my Twitter handle. So follow me there and um, come and have a chat if you want, if you want to. Excellent. Liv, thank you very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Wish you all the best in your future endeavors after you submit that PhD. Thank you very uh, much. I'm sure you'll have a few offers on the table. So thanks very much. Thanks so much for having me. 